It's good to see Kevin. Okay, so Hello. here we are on. Hi, on Kevin. Uh, I hardly recognized you in the in the weeds, the grass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here we are on Sunday, November seventh, and uh, welcome everybody to the Miami Pioneers and Natives of Dade monthly meeting on Zoom. Today we have a couple of uh, wonderful guests with us. We have Kevin Wynn and Renee Ramos from the Wolfson Moving Image Archives to give us uh, a little feedback and show us a, a little dip into the pool of, of a deep pool of wonderful uh, material that they have, uh, which, which helps document South Florida extremely well. And, and uh, think of the insight that the Wolfson team had to put this together back when and to, uh, and to, and to keep it together and the fact that it exists now and, and uh, the collaboration with Miami-Dade College, I think, is, is giving it extra uh, critical mass to keep it, to keep it rolling. So uh, why don't I uh, begin by uh, allowing uh, Kevin and Renee to introduce themselves to us. Uh, gentlemen, welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, uh, my name is Renee Ramos. I'm the director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Image Archives, Moving Image Archives. Uh, as you can see, it, it's quite a mouthful to say the whole thing. We, we typically go by our street name, which is the Wolfson Archives. Um, and um, I'll let uh, Kevin introduce himself and then we'll get, we'll get going. I'm the public programming coordinator at the archives and I also work on most of the online stuff. Uh, they don't have me doing TikTok yet, but uh, <laughs> I do select uh, clips for our online platforms, including YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. So, and those, and by the way, those little bits are wonderful shares. Uh, you know, and I think you do a wonderful job of pulling out some nice little stuff and, and putting that on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, we had a massive hit this year. And, and always, always worth a stop at what you're doing for a moment and have a look at that stuff. Well, thank you. We had a massive hit this week. Uh, it's footage from like 1961. It's only like about 20 seconds, but it's an F-86 fighter plane on a truck being pulled to the streets of Houmstead to uh, sit in front of a park, which I think eventually became Harris Field Park, but had a different name at the time. And I think it was smaller. And I thought, well, finally something for the homestead people to get interested in. And they did, but it, lots of other people were also interested. So it's constantly surprising what people pick up on. Yeah, and that is, that is proudly displayed along US-1 where old Dixie Highway breaks off in Homestead. Um, and I, I'm not sure if there is also one at Harris Field, but it's a little further north where they have it planted. And, uh, and you know, you can't underestimate the value that the Homestead Air Base had to South Dade. I mean, it was uh, it was tomatoes and airplanes, you know, and uh, that was the economy for quite a long time. Let me ask you a question on that film. I saw a person walking along uh, Chrome Avenue there, uh, kind of in front of the camera. And I wonder if you've identified that person. No, we don't have specific identifications of people uh, in the card file that WTVJ left us with the film but somebody recognized in the middle of one frame where they're kind of doing a semi-presentation or just standing around and kind of congratulating each other there's a man in the black suit who apparently was like the mayor of homestead at the time and his son recognized him would that be harris or uh, a different uh yeah it's harris. so uh we always like it when somebody finds somebody they from there Yes, family, you know, say, oh, that's my dad, that's my grandfather. And this is certainly, the, yeah, uh, Robert, you were talking about metadata and how we actually add description to it, the material. Part of our work has been to make it available and make it uh, publicly available and really bringing, bringing the material out to the public has, helped, has been um, a way to enrich the finding aids that we have in the in the system and how people are actually able to help us the public helps us describe the material because so you know many of us who work at the archives we we don't have this the same context we're coming at it from different angles so it's it's a uh, it's really invaluable uh help i'm going to i'm going to start rolling through these slides uh so we can um show some of this material to you and share it i want to make sure that everybody is uh seeing my full screen here and um 
what I'm going to play now is just a little introductory video that tells you a little bit about the archives and what we do, just give you a, a little bit of a deeper dive. Don't want to take up too much of your time with this because we've got some really cool stuff to show you, but here we go. The Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives and the College Archives at Miami Dade College, located in downtown Miami. We will take you behind the scenes to reveal our secrets on how we get archival collections ready for you to access them. We've got film and video relating to Florida from the last 100 years, including news footage, home movies, travelogues, and public affairs programming. We also house the institutional archives of Miami-Dade College, with everything from videos and photographs to brochures and even old yearbooks. We hope you will join us for future episodes as we show you what goes on behind the scenes at the archives. We'll share some more uh, contact information with you, but uh, just I uh, want to run through a, a quick slide here just to give you a little more background and please, you are all welcome to come. We are back open for business and we are um, having um, screenings that Kevin does twice a week at noon on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, uh, we call the series Rewind and Kevin is curating um, topical material uh, related to what's going on in the world and, and sometimes what, what just uh, strikes his fancy, which is always something cool. And he uh, is playing that on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you're always welcome to come by. We're right off of Second Avenue in downtown Miami. We have our own Metro Mover stop, the College Bayside Station will take you right to us. And so uh, just to tell you what our institutional focus is, we are Florida focused. Um, we are one of several um, official repositories for the state of Florida for uh, audiovisual materials. We've got 23 million feet of film and 35,000 hours of videotape. And the way I make that real for folks is if you took a film reel and it was big enough, you could grab one end of the film and walk all the way to Los Angeles and walk back. And that would be the amount of actual physical film that we have in the archives. And we have a 35,000 hour uh, Netflix queue that would take you something like 19 years to watch uh, everything that we've got on videotape. We're operated by Miami-Dade College, and we have three full-time staff and five part-time staff. Our facility is 9,000 square feet in downtown. And the way that we grow our collection is the three Ds, donations and dumpster dives. Uh, basically, what we've been doing is um, taking home movie donations over these years, and people uh, bring us their Super 8 films, their family films. So we have amassed a collection of about 4,000 home movies related to Florida. And it's all kinds of things. Everything that you can imagine would be in a home movie, we've got it. And it really helps to tell the story. Um, sometimes um, we have gotten calls from television stations and some employee says, hey, you know, they're throwing everything out in the video vault. You guys got to come over here. And we actually did that with WPLG a number of years ago. Um, it's happened a couple of times in our history. So a lot of the material that we get, we have rescued because there really hasn't been a big priority in saving videotape uh, from, from uh, the television news era. So um, our type of museum, our type of archive is actually quite rare. Um, so anything related to Florida on film or tape is what we take. And you can access us online and on-site viewing, if you have a special research interest, we can always take requests, we play requests. And if you want us to put together a special program, um, we love to do that. And that's uh, today is an example of, of how we do that. So I'm not going to uh, spend any more time talking about the uh, institution itself. I'm gonna hand it over to the illustrious Mr. Kevin Wynn. Okay, so we're gonna start with we found the name of the organization with pioneers and I kind of, we kind of thinking pioneering things, pioneering things, early things and came across a lot of iterations of 
interpretations of what a pioneer might be, but we came up with uh, a lot of material from the earlier days in Miami. And this is a excerpt from a 1961 uh, news special, Miami Hits a Million, which we've cut a few bits out where Ralph Rennick talks about a couple of early historic sites and what, what became of them. Roll it, please. Tonight, we will trace the history of this city on Biscayne Bay from when it was nothing until it was something. FYI. My apologies. Let me start us at about here. Until it was something. FYI. For your information, another in the series of special reports produced by WTVJ News. Mrs. Tuttle set up housekeeping next to an old army barracks, Fort Dallas, built in 1849. The so-called fort was later moved to a site in Lummis Park where it remains today. The fort at one time was used to house Negro slaves. It later was utilized as Dade County's first courthouse. The Brickell Mansion occupied the point on the south bank. On the north side of the river, tour boats and pleasure craft docked. The only way to cross the river was by boat. The Brickell Mansion still stands today, weather beaten and unkept. William Brickell's daughter, Miss Maud, died here last year. Some people want to move the house and preserve it as a historic site. So the commonality that comes out of this thing is that in the pioneer days, not of Miami, but of historical preservation in Dade County in South Florida, the big strategy was to pick something up and move it. When somebody wanted the piece of real estate that a historical building was sitting on, and they were going to take it regardless, the, 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 the main thing that happened was to move it. So they moved the barracks, uh, and they also moved this structure. Uh, this is a report from 1974. The reporter is Martha Teichner, and there's some very uh, sketchy video in this, which, for which we apologize. If you roll this, please. Dade Heritage Trust would like to preserve nine historical buildings. This is one of them, this house on Northwest 8th Avenue. Behind the stone and behind all the additions is the Wagner Homestead, which is supposed to be the oldest residence in Dade County. So this is the Wagner Homestead as it appeared in its original location. And it had been added to over the years. Um, and it was one of several buildings set aside with the idea of preserving them. Wagner had come down here to help service the army garrison at Fort Dallas during the last phase of the Seminole War. Also apparently just from the pioneering urge, his um, family married in with the Adam C. Richards family, who were also outstanding early pioneers, and produced a series of generations who are still with us. Now, this territory at that time attracted a lot of very adventurous people who were looking for a outdoor, tropical kind of life, they certainly could find it in Miami of the 1860s. So what kind of surroundings did this house have at that time? Well, this would have had nothing around it but jungle, native scrub growth, no neighbors within uh, any number of miles. I would imagine the nearest people living would be Indians in the Glades and a few settlers in what is now downtown. And that was all they wrote. Well, that, that was David Alexander, who was in the Historical Society of Southern Florida at the time. The reporter on this story is a woman named Martha Teichner who later uh, got a job with CBS News and was a very, and still is with CBS News. She does CBS This Morning Reports, but she's also a very well-known uh, international uh, journalist who held down bureaus in a lot of uh, world capitals. Uh, she had a couple years at WTVJ early in her career, which she mentions low down no, in her bio. Is the, oh. oh. She had a bad day when they recorded this. Uh, the, the, the skinny from people who were at WTBJ a long time ago when she was there were that the management at WTBJ didn't care much for her and didn't give her their plum assignments. But one of the things she did was this very thorough a report on nine sites they wanted to preserve. So the reins of preservation for this is to move it. 
And this is the day in 1984 when they moved the Wagner homestead from its location in Miami to Lummis Park. And this is also from 1984. It has been replaced. It moved to Lummis Park, and they're finishing up the restoration work on it to open it as an historic site. This story also includes a couple of glimpses of the other historic buildings, the old Fort Dallas barracks, and that craziest of Miami monuments, the Scottish Rite Temple. Raise your hand if you've been inside the Scottish Rite Temple. It's a thing. Beautiful, beautiful place. So here we are putting the final, final touches on this. The ne our next selection of clips deals with a historic site that you can't really pick up and move no matter what you want to do. The Cape Florida Lighthouse's first clips from 1959. A long time ago, this 95 foot high pile of red brick was a bright new lighthouse. It's on the tip of Key Biscayne and is known as the Cape Florida Light. It'll be 135 years old in a few months. The lantern, cold for the past 80 years, once flashed warnings to ships at sea, telling them of the dangerous reefs and shoals off the end of this tiny island. 11 years after it was built, in the year 1836, Indians attacked the light, setting it afire. The keeper, John Thompson, and a Negro handyman were trapped in the tower. Bullets and arrows were thick in the air. The Negro burned to death. Thompson scared the Indians off with a simple but effective maneuver. He dropped a barrel of gunpowder in the flames. When the southern tip of Key Biscayne was sold, it was feared this historic relic would fall victim to the bulldozers. But this won't happen. This light and the area around it will be turned into a park. This is Ron Oppen at Cape Florida. The first state park in Dade County, and the first anywhere in the state with its own private lighthouse, opened officially to the public on January 1st of this year. On the balmy breeze sort of day, the Chamber of Commerce likes to export north in winter on films to still shivering would-be tourists. The combination of the weather and the occasion brought out an estimated 2,500 persons. And apparently, they liked what they saw and spread the word. At least that's the only logical explanation for the fact that the park has already set statewide attendance records, nearly tripling the previous record high for attendance at a state park anywhere in Florida on a single day. And all this despite the fact that the entire Cape Florida park area is still under construction with bulldozers and heavy earth-moving equipment carefully chiseling their way through stands of virgin pines and coconut palms, carving out roads that should be completed sometime in July. That was from 1967 when the park was open, but not yet completed and not yet dedicated. This is a clip from 1968. This is a film shooting on location at Cape Florida. It's a film starring Frank Sinatra called Lady in Cement. I don't know if you get a glimpse of old blue eyes in this clip. The guy in the red jacket is the film's director, Gordon Douglas, who was an old Hollywood hand who got his start uh, directing uh, our gang movies. This is a clip from 1970 showing the reconstructed uh, Lighthouse Keeper's Cottage. Uh, I believe the park was dedicated in 1974. We have footage, a story of the dedication in 1974 where Ruben Askew, the governor, is dedicating the park. And then standing behind him are a bunch of protesters with signs reading Free Pitts and Lee, which was this tremendous controversy at the time. So uh, everything's embedded in the time in which it happened. But this was kind of the restoration of what the uh, keeper's cottage would have been like. I have a question for you, or maybe um, if you don't know, uh, to anybody in the in the group, I noticed a uh, carved Masonic symbol in the lighthouse, and I was wondering, I, this is the first time I've ever seen that, um, if we know the origin of that or where that might have come from. Oh, 
the fact that it might have been built by Masons, or I don't know. Okay. I oh. thought I saw graffiti on the either side of the door too. So apparently, it's still. Yeah, some maybe I'll maybe a little later I'll share a, a, the frame where I, where I actually saw it. Um, but you know, it was interesting and first trying to figure out who who actually got up there to carve it if it wasn't the original. But anyway. Uh, next up, we're moving to Coconut Grove, and this is the barnacle. This footage was shot in 1970 when the state was contemplating purchasing it, but they had not yet done so. So this is just some standard B-roll of the uh, surroundings. What year were you born here? Shall I tell her? 1900. What was it like to live here? Was it difficult when you were a little girl? No, it was fun. It was fun. It was a pretty free life. Patty Monroe Catlow came home for a visit today. It was open house at the Barnacle, built of coral rock and Dade County pine by her father, Commodore Ralph Monroe, in 1892. The Barnacle is a state historic site now, a gracious reminder of those pioneers who braved Indians, mosquitoes, and life without air conditioning to carve coconut grove out of the tropical wilderness. Did you ever live through a hurricane here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you? No. Don't. The old house has survived some pretty bad storms, even more threatening some pretty heavy bids from developers. The Commodore would have liked that. He was an environmentalist nearly a century before it became chic. The barnacle was created in harmony with the land. Its creator documented the development of Coconut Grove in photographs. Touches of his own personality abound within the house. A gingerbread railing, real sea captain's woodwork rings the attic. Sea chests and trunks fill the rooms. Outside, the boathouse is still standing at the edge of the bay, and a sailboat the Commodore designed the same year he built the house is permanently berthed in the yard. Next door, the angled wood and glass of a high-priced townhouse development jut through the trees, sharp contrast to the past. There's no going back, but the barnacle is there for remembering. I didn't really, really realize how wonderful it was until I got much older. And then I realized what the younger children are being held back and what we had instead of, it was really wonderful. So Patty Monroe Catlow was really the uh, highlight of that interview, highlight of that story. Uh, she worked at the library, I believe, in Coconut Grove, and she also taught sailing at that exclusive girls' school that was located down in Coconut Grove, of which we have footage. I was going to share footage today of one of their pageants where they're all dressed up as princes and fairies and little woodland creatures, but it goes on for like 30 minutes. We didn't have time. So this is a historic site. I, is this still a thing down in South Day? Yeah, I, it's still I there. Been. Every year it gets a little closer to the road, you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's so close to the road. I mean, I joke about that, but it's still there well, is, and uh, it's been rebuilt numerous times and it's, it's in very much in need of it now. Well, this is 1981. So this is the first, it has not yet happened, but this is like the first restoration of the Anderson Corner Store. The year is 1914. Anderson's Corner Store in what is now South Dade is the only general store for miles and miles. People come here to buy clothes and farm equipment, but for these frontier people, Anderson's is more than a store. It's the center of community life. Today, Anderson's Corner Store is one of the last pioneer buildings still standing in Dade County, but a few years ago, its future was in question. It was first condemned and then set for demolition, but the building was saved back in 1977 when it was declared a national landmark. And this afternoon, the Dade County Historic Preservation Board also declared the building an historic place and approved a plan by the building's owners to renovate Anderson's into a restaurant and saloon. What do you expect? Anderson's Corner to be like two years from now? Uh, lots of music, lots of folks having a good time, <laughs> eating and drinking. It'll be nice. It'll be nice. And that's great news for people like Ruth Jones. Mrs. Jones has lived in the neighborhood for 30 years now, and she's closely followed the long battle to preserve the building. 
I think it's marvelous, just great, because there's so many old buildings. Well, there's not too many left, and what is left should be preserved. But it will be at least a year before the restaurant is open for business. First, $200,000 worth of renovations are needed. And when it's all through, the building will look pretty much like it did back in 1914. Robin Carter, Channel 4 News. Charlie Burr has lived oh, on this land all his life. He was born just a few hundred yards away. He grows strawberries, and he's got about 12 and a half acres of strawberries in South Dade. There used to be 10 times that acreage of strawberries grown here, but that was before foreign competition. The Mexican uh, strawberry growers, uh, by planting at high altitude down there, are able to compete with us almost any time of the year. Uh, they, they have a labor advantage on us in that uh, a man down there will work all day long for the same price we pay for one hour, about, just about an hour. And, uh, of course, we can't beat that kind of a deal. Prices for equipment keep going up. Everything is consistently more expensive on a farm, but quality and dollar value often suffer from this early picking and long distance moving. These necessarily have to be picked from Mexico at this stage of growth because uh, they won't make it make the journey, the trip, and hold up for the, for the retailer. The taste is poor, it's flat, a little flavor. It definitely takes sugar to make them taste sweet. The burrs have lots of ways they sell their strawberries, but they only move them a few feet in strawberry milkshakes, in strawberry ice cream, and fresh strawberries. Not only do they taste delicious, but they're part of what keeps some folks going. Well, I'm on a diet, and they're, it's a great diet food. The calories are lower, and it's filling. Charlie Burr says he'll keep growing strawberries for many years yet. Christopher Peak, Channel 4 News. Charlie Burr is a local farmer who takes to the air to keep an eye on a crop that never gets far off the ground. Unlike other crops that often get killed off during South Florida's winters, Charlie Burr's strawberries thrive in cold weather. Because of this season's early chill, South Dade strawberry farmers think they may be heading for a good season. Uh, you got to have a good start to have a good season, and it, we, we have a good start so far. Could be the beginning of a good season for Could them. be the beginning of a good season, yes. The Burr Strawberry Fields off Southwest 216th Street are a popular local attraction. South Dade strawberry crops come into season Christmas time with the beginning of South Florida's cool weather. The Burr family has been raising strawberries here for several generations. Charlie Burr was born and raised in a small house behind these strawberry fields. He says he's seen a lot of changes in South Florida over the past 40 years. But he adds he still likes it here. I've seen a lot of my friends have left this area and a lot of them have come back. The grass always looks greener on the other side. But uh, I like it, and uh, I plan to spend the rest of my time right here, probably growing strawberries. Al Sunshine, Channel 4 News, South Dade. So as we said, we always love it when somebody sees family members on our footage. Yeah, that, so that, was, was, that was really cute. And, and Al Sunshine, too, you know, in, in what looks like his uh, prime of his uh, broadcasting career. And uh, yeah. sadly, as I think most people realize, the, the Burr Farm was sold after uh, Charlie's wife, my Aunt Mary, uh, uh, died a couple of years ago. And Lennar has already uh, torn it all down and built some homes. So. No, of course. Well, my, grand, my mother's father had uh, an avocado grove uh, down in, uh, well, actually, near Homestead, I think it was called Modelo, whether it was uh, incorporated or not. And when they passed on, they sold the property off and that is, was completely built over with uh, little houses. So now we are getting into pioneer days in South Dade, kind of pioneer days, if you would roll it, please, Renee. Uh, Aladdin City, not much of an evidence of a, la of a real city here, although if you were around for the end of the 2008 land bust, you, this is a familiar sight to you. The streets go nowhere. This is a home movie taken in South Dade, uh, Route 1926 uh, or 25. There's actually a shot of a fruit fair, which I think took place in 1926. But 
we used to think, oh, look, it's all these interesting pictures of Aladdin City and other places in South Bay. And then when you watch it long enough, you realize this film is all about real estate. Uh, there are a couple of things here where this is these people with it getting, a, getting a spiel about Aladdin City. This is downtown in a city you might recognize. This is Homestead, the place of my birth, substantially before I was born, mind you. Traffic, exciting then and exciting now, I guess. This is actually the fire station, which I think is like the city hall now. It's um, the museum. Oh, yeah. So this is downtown Homestead, and this is one of the buses that people would get on to go out and look at uh, a real estate development. In this case, it's a, a, an area called Redland Bowers, which in another part of this, and here's the fruit festival, which has this uh, very distinctive gateway, which we were dating it to 1926, according to some uh, material from the historical museum. Um, Redland Bowers is out from Homestead and they were building a town. We have another section of this film, which we're not showing today, where they are laying out streets and sidewalks, but that apparently didn't come off. But sometimes if you do real estate searches in that area, you'll find them houses or what, that are located in an area called Redland Bowers. So that's your local jazz band providing some entertainment for the uh, people coming to find out about real estate. I would say maybe my grandfather was in this footage because my grandfather was in a jazz band when he was in high school, but he graduated in high school like seven or eight years after this film was shot. So he's too young to be in this footage. This is a, a billboard for Redland Bowers. And this is out from uh, Homestead. I think this is, I'm gonna, yeah, I believe this is Redland Bowers. Although shortly we're gonna go back into town. The circus, I don't know. I'm not sure what this is about. Lots of crowds and lots of uh, old vehicles everywhere. There are a couple of sections of this film that are like this, that are almost like portraits of people not so much these people talking, but they'll get into individual shots of people. Man, everybody has everybody has a little flavor in this place. I think it, it speaks to the power of land speculation and the wildness that, that went on with that was just uh, beyond description. Well, that's true. Here's the thing where they have these individual pictures of people. There was a genre of movie. It was not made by studios. It was made by itinerant filmmakers who went around to a town and early in the week, they would shoot footage of individual people in a town. And then at the end of the week, they would show the film at a local theater and they would get a fee from the uh, theater management or something. And people would come to see themselves on the screen. I don't know if this is a if this is inspiring this part of these films or not. But at this time period, people were doing that. So somebody might have gotten that idea there. So coming up before too long, there's actually a little bit of silent comedy from the people who were making this movie, which reflects the uh, real estate frenzy that was going on in the latter stages of the boom here. If you recognize anybody, don't hesitate to say, I know who that is. I think such a such an enterprise as you suggest where going around and shooting people in a town and then playing it back for them it's just an amazing thing to leave behind. To the extent that they are left behind. I mean, I, I understand that there are some of them. It seems not have been a big thing in Florida, but 
uh, in other places, other rural areas, it was a big deal. These are the burgers of uh, Redland Bowers. They reappear driving around in their big uh, convertible looking very lordly. They do have quite the nice car, don't they? They do. Now this is the silent comedy bit. You notice once this uh, light flare passes, this guy is like painting for sale signs. And we did not speed this footage up. They're actually like be speeding up. Now he's act actually painting them. He's just miming them. So this is like a little commentary from these people about the pace of real estate going on embedded in this amateur movie. Oh, now we're getting familiar material. If you just roll this, <clears throat> this is the Miami Daily News building when it was new, 1925, 1926. And this is a professional or at least a semi-professional movie that as far as we can tell is a promotional film, the Miami Herald. Whether it would have been shown in theaters as a kind of short film or a promotional film uh, we don't know. This came to us from Channel 4, and Channel 4 just had a couple of big reels of completely miscellaneous historical footage, and this is one of them. So the reporter guy hops off the running board into the news building, which is right across from where the American Airlines Arena is now. You could throw a baseball from the porch of this building. So he puts paper into his typewriter, and he types away, and types a couple of lines. And then the copy boy takes it away. We think this may be a very early precursor of tweets. And then the rest of this is like the process of a news story or part of a news story going through the organization of the Miami News. And all of this taking place in the news building. This looks like linotype, although I could be wrong. Also, he, this, I think this guy's a telegrapher. He's going to telegraph the story and spread it far and wide. The actual newspapers come out. This is in the back of the news building. The papers come down this slide and slide directly into the back of the truck. Yep, not a, not a flawless system, but they're working on it. So there's the tower in the far distance on the right, dropping off papers for the newsboy. And notice the tremendous plantings all around the streets here, which always seduced people crazily. And here's a standard issue Florida House of 1925, 1926. And uh, clearly they had something to learn about uh, promotion because they decided to end this film on a down note. The man in the fourth, first part who was supposedly in a car accident didn't make it, which future generations of uh, Florida salespeople would uh, figure out how wrong that was. This is a, an amateur or a semi-professional film from about 1930. If you roll it, Renee, I don't think, it, is it rolling? Oh, no, oh, there it is. It's shot from the air over Miami Beach. There's also a shot in this film, a very overexposed, not very helpful shot of Miami. This is the channel in government cut. And they also flow down to the Keys, and the Florida Keys are just these big islands covered with trees. I don't, I don't get it. But this is looking west. I think that's the Fleetwood Hotel moving into the center of the frame here in the upper part of the frame. And back at the top of the frame, you can see the islands. There's that monument island, isn't it? Yeah, there's the monument there. And you can see that nobody is home yet. They are not very well developed yet. The Floridian Hotel is just about to get covered over by the pontoon on that plane. And this is Fifth Street coming into view right about in the middle of the frame. Right, I think that's Fifth Street. Or maybe this is Fifth Street down here. Yeah, I think that's Fifth Street. Down to South Point. And uh, government cut, complete with shifts, ships. So the Floridian Hotel was built in 1926. 
It later became known as the Biscaya, and it was demolished by uh, implosion in about the late 80s, I think. It was a major place for people who were victims of the 1926 hurricane to gather, and they did a lot of aid for people. Government cut. Uh, so it made a lot of news during the 1926 hurricane. So since we're on the aviation uh, kick, this is from 1969. It takes place on Dodge Island. Can you roll it, please? Days when the sky was reserved for birds and Apollo was known only to the student of mythology, Arthur Burns Chalk opened a flying service in Miami. Fifty years have passed since the days of the one-man operation with an umbrella, a desk, and one amphibious airplane. Now six planes of the Chalk Flying Service fly the same routes that once took equipment to rum runners and made many surveillance lights for revenuers. Pappy Chalk is 82 years old, but you can still detect the spark in him that made a flight to Bimini something to remember. Pappy learned to fly in Paducah, Kentucky. Since that time, he has chalked up more than 16,800 flying hours, or 700 days. Miami City officials once tried to run him out of town. Today, they presented Pappy with a citation, hailing him as a pioneer in aviation. It was a day to renew old acquaintances and talk about the good old days. Well, I'm just working between getting the information both sides, you know. <laughs> At one time, the city of Miami uh, thought the best thing to do would be to run you out of town. They kind of changed their mind after that. What caused that? Well, all these the boat captains uh, come in and uh, rescued me, you know, went to bat for me. And after the city knew what was going on entirely, why they approved of it, you know, and didn't bother me much anymore. If you look back over the years of your, your flying, what would be the one thing that you'd remember the most out of all the years? My first uh, flight in uh, 1911. But an old Benmore, B-N-O-I-S-C, Benmore, they call it, with Tony Janice at Paducah, Kentucky. That gave me the fever. <laughs> Can't get rid of it. Happy Chalk made his last flight about a year ago, but Chalk planes have never stopped flying, and more than likely, they never will. Arthur Burns Chalk, truly. Oh. One of those magnificent men and his flying machine. This is Jim Loy reporting. So that was a story from 1969, uh, obviously the 50th anniversary of the Chalks Flying Service, which started obviously in 1919. One of the great things we have in the collection is that they'll do interviews with these people who were genuine Miami pioneers uh, who may have not been able to do a full-fledged oral history or something like that, but we do have a little bit of them. Although I think Pappy Chalk was doing a bit of uh, image building when he said that the city of Miami wasn't going to shut him down once they talked to the boat captains he worked with. Um, if you would roll this, please, Renee. This is a uh, work on the railroad, and this includes footage of part of the Overseas Railroad. Um, this is kind of categorized for us as a home movie or an amateur film. Um, Maybe it's just familiarity, but the more I watch it, the more I think, well, maybe not. Although in this hand, in this case, that exposure tends to uh, suggest semi-pro at best. What's the year on this, Kevin? Do we know? Uh, this is, I think, a little before 19... 20, although there might be sections. Of, there's a section of this also that is a hurricane, which probably is from the mid 1920s. So it might all be from the same time. People with their home movies will kind of just cut reels together. And sometimes you don't really tell. Well, some uh, of that could have been repairing, repairing railroad from some sort of a, an issue, huh? It could have been. There was a, there was one of those little sidecar things going down the track. But this 
probably is this a seven mile bridge i don't know it looks like it's a long bridge that is the seven mile bridge there's a cow in the shadow of the seven mile bridge yeah that's pigeon key That's a schoolhouse there. Okay, okay. Ooh. That might have been the rotating uh, uh, mechanism in the middle of the seven mile bridge that allowed a uh, boat to pass. Yeah, some technological wonder of the 19 teens. Okay. Oh my goodness, I'm not sure this. So here's some hurricane, post-hurricane material. Uh, this film doesn't have a very good ID. We think this is probably 1926, but And I don't know how we're doing on time, Renee and uh, Rob, in terms of the overall presentation. If you want to leave time for questions, et cetera, et cetera, we might just uh, end on this and end on this footage. She has a ways to go yet. I think that's up to the group. We're happy to keep going. Yeah, I think, yep. I think let's keep going. If anybody needs to bow out or for any reason, they they can leave us. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go a little longer. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, we, as, long as, as long as you can stand it, we can stand it. We'll put it that way. <laughs> well, we, Dolly, we, Dolly we said don't stop. So obviously we can't. I saw that. So love the pines. Pines. Yeah. Papaya tree. Yeah. So we just probably, see better days. That's probably in, Fort, um, in uh, Key Largo, which they had... Uh, they grew a lot of uh, produce there. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can see like concrete block walls have just collapsed. This is pro this clearly uh, looks like after a hurricane. I mean, the power poles are like completely at the wrong angles and are just kind of pushing this railroad track back into position. So that's that's really amazing, isn't it? Probably uh, cleaning up after whichever storm this was. All right. Okay, this is downtown Miami. We figure this is in the middle 1920s. Uh, the Magic City is earning its name by being under construction so rapidly. It's not always clear what building is what, but that's the mouth of the Miami River. So this is the north bank of the Miami River, which was hotels and condominiums at the height of the boom. I don't know that any of that is there anymore. This is uh, the Bayfront, which this is what basically amounted to be the port of Miami was pulling up alongside the waterfront. And there's the skyline in the background. So this is the beginning of Bayfront Park here. Well, it's not Bayfront Park yet, I don't think. Gallister Hotel. And if it keeps going, we will shortly get a glimpse of Henry Flagler's hotel right there. Yeah, the Royal Palm. Yep. 
soon to reach. This is Flagler Street. That's the marquee of the Olympia Theater there in the center. Uh, I'm always surprised with this footage by how many trees there are in, on Flagler Street. It's like a suburban street where the tree canopy grows over the street here on one end. It's really kind of remarkable. That's the Elks Club and I think the McAllister Theater at the end of where it meets Biscayne. And here we're driving what will, I guess, become Biscayne Boulevard. Very artistic photograph there of the uh, city. The Everglades there, isn't it? Yeah, in the back. And there's the Everglades in the center there, the tower of the Everglades Hotel. This is from the uh, Venetian Causeway, clearly. That's the Freedom. That's the Freedom Tower, the Miami News Tower. How about that skyline? Yeah, even this then, is, enough this, cranes to go around, huh? And this is a dredge right there. The kind of stuff thing they use to like pull up the bay bottom. So this is the County Causeway, which became the MacArthur Causeway, and a streetcar is going to come zipping by in a minute, I think. Yeah, people forget that there was a streetcar built into that from the original plan in 1916. Yep. I like that the barriers are just wooden uh, barriers along the side of it. It's very uh, reassuring. There was a streetcar line uh, going down Coral Way from, from I believe. Was yeah, there, there was, and, and also through Coral Gables. Uh, yeah. We actually have footage of uh, from 1956 of the workmen tearing the streetcar tracks out of the city, uh, out of the street in Coral Way. So this is about 1930. This is a home movie produced by a family named Prince. And they came from, nor I think they came from Chicago or somewhere up north and they documented their trip in great detail with the plane trip and every, uh, the, the train trip, excuse me, and everything. And this is when they get to downtown and this is the Everglades Hotel, which I think they were staying, or as one would say in the 1920s, stopping at the Everglades Hotel. So that's Bayfront Park, or soon will be Bayfront Park. What a wonderful the upper park. And people parading up and down. This is not the biggest parade we have on footage here. This is going to be looking west, I believe, or panning to the west from the roof of the Everglades Hotel. This is more toward the north, very short shot. This is downtown. This is basically Flagler Street and the surrounding areas. That's the uh, Gusman Theater now, which was in the Olympia. A fruit company where you could send fruit to your friends in colder climates. That's a church that used to be across the street from the, uh, or just down the street from the Olympia. This is across the street from the Olympia. There's a theater called, at this time, still called the Fairfax, I think. Yeah, barely see it. Shortly to become the Paramount. Here's a longer shot of it. Yeah. Biscayne Bay. Bayfront Park. So this is the real old time Bayfront Park where it was kind of like a big open garden. There was a little fountain at the uh, terminus of uh, Flagler Street at the park where there's now a massive fountain which usually doesn't have much water in it. Oh. I think that's where Night it is. Night has fallen. <laughs> okay. 
now. This is one of our bonus shots. This is 1974. This is from that same series of Martha Teichner reports, I believe, about uh, historic sites. Uh, we'll leave David Alexander to explain the significance of this building, not those buildings. but The few surviving examples of that style of architecture right before the Spanish uh, fashion became the, you know, the sole mode, and is also one of the largest surviving poured concrete structures in Miami. But I think the most important thing about it is its connection with the Brickell family. Uh, William Brickell, having come here in 1871, was one of the first uh, settlers in what is now the city of Miami, had the first trading post and general store, and owned uh, most of the bayfront south of the river. Uh, this thing was built, he was already deceased, but it was named the Bulmer Apartments for his uh, widow, Mary Brickell, uh, who had been a Bulmer in Australia before coming here. And it had been a very prestigious uh, place to live, what they used to call a residence with a capital R rather than an ordinary apartment house. In fact, it's kind of hard to imagine Miami without this building. It's been here for so long a time, and one of the more attractive uh, early structures. It will leave sort of a space in our jaws, like taking out a major tooth. But this kind of thing goes on, and I guess we'll continue as long as there are buildings to be pulled down. On a happy note there from David Alexander. Yeah, so this was a very uh, high-end place to stay back in the 19-teens. Of course, this is the Four Ambassadors, which is right across the street from it, which is still there. And was also a uh, location for a Frank Sinatra movie in 1968. This is an interesting story. I think Martha Teichner reports this. This is Merrick Manor in Coral Gables. And she's going to interview a man named W.H. Philbrick, or W.L. Philbrick, excuse me who I believe was uh, an undertaker, had a funeral home business, but also was like this community gadfly and somebody who ran for office a couple times, not very successfully, and was very hip, big on placing ads in the newspaper and making newspaper stories where he was uh, taking the city fathers of Miami to task for various things. So he wants, he has a plan, but uh, it's going to be difficult to... Uh, put the plan in motion due to some vagaries of state law. So, A, this is the Merrick House in Coral Gables before it was restored, uh, which is an interesting thing to see. Sometimes it's just too dark for the film camera to really get a great shot. Yeah, humidity seems to be playing havoc with the library collection there. So the, the house had been not been a single family home for a while. It had been uh, used as a kind of apartment house, boarding house type place for a while before it finally closed. Philbrick wanted to restore it and make it into an historical site. And that's him with the reporter sitting near the house. The law requires uh, literary, scientific, charitable purposes or for profit-making purposes. Merrick Manor is not an educational institution and not a literary institution, scientific, religious, a charitable institution, or a profit-making institution. To be historical means to be none of the above. None of them above at all. There's no laws in the state of Florida presently is brought to my attention or by an authorized person such as Attorney General of the State of Florida has uh, defined any historical act in the State of Florida that will be applicable to our situation. The story of Merrick Manor is a Dade County story, but the problem it has is statewide. Without specific laws making historical sites tax exempt, preservation and restoration of them could well be too expensive and houses like Merrick Manor could disappear. Martha Teichner, Channel 4 News. Of course, it didn't disappear. They did eventually uh, preserve it. And I can't help but imagine that the state law has changed so that there are all kinds of tax uh, issues around historic preservation. And if you own a historic house and restore it, there's probably some tax advantages arising from that. But 
in any case, if you've been on a tour of the Merrick House recently, it usually probably doesn't look as dark as it does here. And this is... now, we had a we had a tour recently and, uh, and quite a good tour. And it's amazing. And Phil Brick was a colorful character and, and he actually uh, harassed the city of Coral Gables leaders for years to get them to take it on. And they finally did. Yeah, if you get, it used to be that uh, Yahoo had a, or it was Google, I think, Google had an online newspaper ar archive that you could access for free. Now you'd have to do it through one of the, a pay service. But I actually looked, I actually did a search on Philbrick and this inundation of ads berating everybody in government just started showing up. So he was clearly uh, a very vocal guy in his time. So this is our, the final clip that we prepared here. And I just stuck this in so you could tell where the photo that we used for our uh, image for our uh, announcement came from. This is a 1953, there is. and there he is. This is a live remote broadcast from the Roney Plaza Hotel on Miami Beach of a WTBJ game show called Holiday for Housewives. And they're pretty nice shot of the garden of the uh, Biltmore of the Rony Plaza. This guy comes in on some kind of vehicle and they proceed to we don't have a copy of this show. I would give my right arm to watch the show because I can't imagine the chaos that ensued but there are lots of very uh, retrograde competitions for the housewives to engage in and these massive cameras that they had to drag out this was shot it took place in june on miami beach lugging those cameras around so this was a, a a pioneer television moment that we wanted to share with you if we had time so that's the end of our clips for now we could go on forever and ever and ever but uh time is limited so that's our website and if you go there, you'll find a little link where you can search our catalog. And you can look in your for whoever you want to see or whatever you want to see. And there might be something there. It's quite likely there will be something there, given whatever the time period is. And also, uh, fingers crossed, it will be transferred already. There is a ton of material there. Lots and lots and lots and lots of video, because video can be transferred semi-mechanically because video machines, you place the video cassette inside the machine and it plays and you can digitize it from that. Uh, film is uh, a hands-on medium. So getting a film in shape for digitizing uh, takes actual people doing actual physical processes. So it takes a longer time, but there is a remarkable amount of uh, material that you can find on the now, I imagine you have a certain amount of audio recordings as well, huh? Yeah, I don't know that we have uh, that many uh, straight up audio recordings online now. We have received uh, straight up audio recordings. Most of it seems to be the city of Coral Gables gave us a collection of material that they had, and they were kind of promotional materials largely. Like and radio, also radio spots or something or? Yeah, we've gotten material from TV stations and things, and they're like audio for spots and things like that. So uh, it's not the top priority. Uh, got a and, lot of uh, recordings of the uh, board, the Miami Dade College Board of Trustees. If you ever have trouble sleeping, you can listen to those, and they'll. <laughs> <laughs> that is dazzling material. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's so amazing that, when, you, yeah, when, you, when you look at WLRN, of course, owned by the Dade County School System and with a principal, you know, uh, a mission to, to spread the word and serve the school system. Some of those were incredibly boring and yet brief moments of wonderful, you know, bits in there. And, and I think it was Roger Cobzina in 1949 started that going. And Dade County, I think, has the distinction of one of the, one of the first radio stations run by a school board. Do you know that to be true? I don't know if that's the case or not. I know 1949 was an early time for a school board to own a radio station. And of course- It would that, have been very early on. Yeah, later on WLRN added a video station as well. 
I do, I do believe that the television station predates uh, WPBT, so they were our first public television station here. If I'm not yes, sure. I think you're right. And, and they were always very innovative in terms of trying to use the mediums for educational purposes. And so that, that in itself is, could be a wonderful program someday. Certainly. I think that was absolutely wonderful. Let's, let's give everybody a little hand there. I think that, uh, you know, thank you for a little dip into the archives there. And obviously you could go a hundred ways, you know, deep. And, uh, and, and that was kind of new. We had, little bit of uh you know different parts of town there and some hurricane uh crazy footage which i think is always amazing to see you know how people dealt with the aftermath of the hurricanes and stuff and and uh you know really wonderful really wonderful stuff thank you so questions uh you can unmute yourself uh raise your hand ask a question yes good um what what is the oldest video that you have uh how early did they start taking uh, videos or moving photography that you have in your archives? Renee? Yep. <laughs> Excuse me. You know that that um, that material yeah. from the uh, from the um, overseas railroad is, is getting down into kind of the older the older reaches of our collection. I'd say the 1910s or so. There, there are, I believe, there are some of our um, family films and home movies that are a, even a little bit older than that, probably around 19, 1915 or so. Um, or were you speaking of video in terms of electronic medium, Becky? Well, no, in terms of moving pictures, right, uh, right, not just photography. But when, when was the earliest moving? Uh, in our collection, that's the 1910s. Yeah. 1910s. But we know we know films were made here. You know, even going back to or earlier than that. I mean, to the the days. You know, the early days of Miami. You know. And then, well, we know Edison originally set up his movie making here. I think it all went to Hollywood eventually. But there there is a building which I believe is still there on Eighth Street where the roof actually opened up, and it later became like a disco or something. Um, and, and Edison's early movie making was was set for Miami because of so many days of, of sunshine, and the studio actually had a had a roof that opened up like an accordion, and uh, and their idea there was that was your lighting, yes, uh, you know, and uh, so so yeah, certainly some early stuff was shot in Miami, which it, it did not stay here. There was also um, Kevin does an excellent program on the Fleischer Studios, um, and um, you know they they were um, very important here. Um, some of the um, greats of animation, early animation, were done here as well. Right, I, Ivan Tor's studio also I think was a was a bright and and is that right. still Greenwich Greenwich? I think at mostly at the, essentially is Greenwich Studios. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, there's a fair. There aren't. There's no like impact locally. Yeah, well, there's. We don't have much extensive uh, documentation of any one of them, but there are individual stories about uh, Ivan Tours and a couple of other studios cropped up here and there, and uh, a fair amount of material about uh, films being shot, feature films being shot here. And, and some famous films here are rather infamous. I mean, there was that one with Linda Lovelace, you know, and everything. So yeah, <laughs> you probably don't have that in the archive, but you know. Good, uh, wasn't it? Miami was known um, for, for some other subcategories of movie <laughs> making, shall we say. That well, there's the, the, the infamous nude on the moon fought, uh, shot at the uh, Coral Castle. Um, yes, yes, that's a classic. Yeah. <laughs> That's infamous. Doris Wishman, who uh, whose career seems to have ping pong between uh, the New York area and uh, Miami, and in her latter years, she uh, made she was making films on video, and she was working in Miami toward the end of her career. She we have a, we have a little bit of material with uh, featuring Bunny Yeager. Um, hmm. Did uh, not so much moving images, but did um, a lot of fashion photography. Yeah. Yeah, she was a pioneer in her own in her own way. 
Uh, other questions, Sylvia, did you have a question? You can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, um, the report that you had from 1967 about the Cape Florida Lighthouse, who was the correspondent there? Very baritone Ralph Rennick-like voice, but not yeah. Ralph Rennick. That was Del Frank. Oh, okay. Now, are, are, if you're not familiar with Del Frank, or more likely if you are familiar with Del Frank, the thing that's disorienting about that story is that he's actually in the field reporting something because he anchored like the midday news for years. Uh, but it's relatively unusual that he actually goes out into the field and does a report in the field as he did that. Um, I'm betting he, he, had a, he had a previous career in radio where he developed that, that golden velvet voice, huh? He had a great set of pipes, as some people would have said, um, yeah. And everybody has very good memories of working with him at the uh, at WTVJ, uh, and he was there for many years. But he was primarily an anchor. Very unusual that he went out and covered a story like that. That story it was shot on film, and the way we it's been edited to more or less recreate what it had, would have, what it have looked like on the broadcast. Because what they would do is they would shoot his stand up where he's talking and he's introducing it. And frequently, we'll, and, we'll, and they would shoot a whole long piece of film where he does the narration or the reporter does the narration. So frequently we'll have them standing there looking at the camera, they do it, they do a great professional stand up, and then they go to cover the rest of the story and they start looking at notes, they look directly down to notes and they start reading off notes. And what then they did, they shot silent footage of what they were talking about. And then they would edit that together and they would have two film projectors going one which would be the stand-up and then the audio that continued and then the second projector would cut in with visuals over the audio so once in a while we don't have all of the b-roll or the silent footage so we try to cut it so we don't have our anchors like staring at notes and we don't you, want to embarrass you, them. you you might not have yeah. the edited version maybe sometimes you have the raw uh footage that you've got to sort of reassemble to make it look like it would have presented on tv it's usually very straightforward because it's usually like the audio material is first and then there'll be a splice and then there'll be all of this silent footage. And it's always, it's almost always notated in the original three by five card file, which was compiled by one of the first TVJ employees who was a librarian mm. who organized and labeled and cataloged, well, there was a catalog, but she did label and they built up this enormous card file. If you're old enough to have gone to a library before everything was digital and they would have this big bank of little drawers with little cards in them. We got one of those from WTVJ in 1984 when they donated the collection. And it is an invaluable resource because there is massive amount of material that we would have no idea what we're looking at if we didn't have those cards. Yeah. There were tons of, tons of Ruth Sperling by any chance? That was not Ruth Sperling. I don't remember. Phyllis Williams wasn't? Phyllis Williams, that's right. Oh, Phyllis yeah. Williams. Well, she had an important um, job that was unseen and unheard, didn't she? Yeah. Yes. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth Sperling, Sperling was too. more of the, um, she was uh, Ralph Rennick's kind of right hand, uh, yeah. as, as you as it were. And she um, she did a lot of, she ended up doing a lot of the hiring and the firing at the station of um, reporters and what have you. Yeah, yeah she, she also handled what they called stringers, people that would that would go out and, and capture footage for them on like on a gig of basis. You know, I, I know if, yeah. if people if people weren't aware of it behind the scenes, what, what would happen was you would run out and in the mornings, more or less than not, you'd shoot film and come back. And there was this huge loop of automatic processing that went on to get the film quickly processed you know, within say an hour, and then somebody would very quickly edit it together on a little movieola and then get it ready for six o'clock news. Uh, in the advent of video in the, in the early mid seventies, you know, it was, it was far more instant. You didn't have all of that uh, uh, developing time and, uh, and news became more instant. You began to see beta cams and more, more of this live on location footage. Now to go back to that, that, uh, production at the Roney Plaza, what a big deal it was to have, as, as Kevin said, those giant studio cameras outside. They were never made for that. And to have a remote truck with what would now be a microwave connection right. uh, back to the studio. 
uh, was a tremendously big deal and expensive well, and and uh, state of the art, today? you know, uh, for that time. No small feature, and and for a for a crazy little housewife, you know, competition show. Uh, yeah, and and when you said chaos ensued, I'm sure there were a hundred things that went wrong in a scenario like that. Well, I've seen a couple of Skipper Chuck shows, which were produced in the late 1970s, in the air conditioned studio, not out in the wild. And some of the stuff that goes on there, you're just like, I beg your pardon. There's a there's a one where uh, uh, the wife of uh, or her name escapes me, but uh, Haas's wife, the guy who ran the Serpentarium. Yeah. Clarita. Clarita Haas. Haas. There's a frequent guest on the Skipper Chuck show, and she comes in one day and she's going to show off a tortoise. And she's brought the tortoise to the studio in a brown paper box, which is only just a hair larger than the tortoise is. So they can't just straightforwardly like pick the tortoise up out of the box. And so the tortoise finally gets out and it's on the studio floor. And it immediately starts making a beeline. There's a door part of the set. Not even really go anywhere, but the tortoise doesn't know. The tortoise just makes a beeline for this door, like I know how to get out of this situation. And uh, so, and you're just like, really? I guess it was a yeah. kids' show, so a little a little shagginess around the edges was okay. Yeah, live television and animals. What could go wrong? Right? <laughs> so, and there's another side of archives is that some of these hilarious moments uh, in production history, and anybody I think who worked in the industry back then could could sit you down for two days and tell you some hilarious stories of, of things that didn't go exactly right. Well, yeah. I have a question uh, from someone who's out of town. Um, what do you have uh, available through the internet? Um, are there certain uh, films? Are they indexed somehow that we could see the, on the uh, internet? So if you go to wolfsonarchives.org and that link is in the chat, uh, wolfsonarchives.org. It's at the bottom of the chat right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm on that site right now. On that page, there's a link where it says search our catalog. Yes. Kind of to the left, it's like the second link down. And you, if you click on that link, that will open our online searchable catalog, which is also like viewable if something has been digitized and has been placed on there. So you just basically search for whatever you want to see and see what comes up. Well, for for instance, uh, the the one that you showed of Homestead, uh, where they were going around inter seeing people, I think I saw my grandfather, but it was too fleeting to tell for sure. Um, I would like to review that and and see if it is actually him. How okay. would I do that? Well, why don't I'm going to give you? I'm going to put my email in the chat. Okay. That's very exciting, Frank. <laughs> And if you well, do I'm ID thinking. him, we'd love to add that to our database record because anything where we can identify people, we'd love to fold it back into our search, our search tools. And right, so Kevin added his email account. address in there for you. Yes, that's my email address. I've got it. So if you contact me, I could either put the segment that we showed up today uh, on a private link uh, on YouTube so you could watch it. Great, great. Or, or, or I could otherwise send you to uh that 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 reel of home movies is quite long so if we put the whole thing up you'd probably be searching through at, you know right many minutes. this is the one downtown where they were um looking at different people and it was very fleeting that's why i, I couldn't tell for sure well, but, uh, but he was a businessman down there he owned uh uh horn horn hardware um which was a three-story building they had a three-story building there and oh my well, it only occurs to me now that my great grandfather what owned a hardware store in Homestead too, and I'm just thinking I haven't seen a good picture of him. What was his name? Time, so I wonder if he's in that. <laughs> what was his name, Kevin? Oh goodness, I uh, it was well when, but I don't remember what his first name was. Well, I remember some wins uh, from Homestead, but I I didn't associate them with a hardware store. So, had some well, other... this was. This, he would have been had the store uh, at the time, more or less at the time of that film. But then he he still operated it for several years. When I was a kid, we would go down there. We would hear about his hardware store, but I never went there. My my father, my grandfather on my father's side, 
uh, was F. A. Wynn, who was the postmaster at Homestead from about the mid 1960s into the early 1970s. So sometimes people recognize him or know him because, you know, their grandfather was in the city government and they knew one another somehow. So. No, he would have been well known, the postmaster. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and he worked for the post office beginning in the 1930s. So mm. you know, he's probably a carrier and did a little bit of everything. Fabulous, fabulous I, stuff. I have another question for you. Uh, do you yeah. have some of the programs that were broadcast um, from from Miami to the country uh, back when you know you used, used to have live things come? For instance, um, a historic thing would be uh, New Year's Day on 1959. Uh, there was during the halftime show they announced that Castro had taken Cuba. You have that. That would be great. That hasn't shown up as far as I know. We have extensive coverage of, of New Year's Day, 1959. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the, you know, the orange ball. Uh, if it's, the thing about that is, is if that's network coverage, it's likely that we will not have that because the WTBJ collection was essentially their material which they had produced and that they had the rights to sure sure whether they would even keep a copy of a network show this happens once in a while on facebook people want to figure out what's happened to all the skipper chuck shows and they say oh they're in the archive and say, yeah call channel four and they'll tell you where they are and channel four will just say skipper what uh the the shelf space was limited the number of videotapes they could record and keep was limited uh so actually like air checks, which is a recording of a live recording of like an on-air thing, are among the rarest things we have. Because they were the they first didn't... to go when they needed more room, right. I guess, right? Well, well, they would also, for a while, once the video came in, there are some videotapes we have where it says Tuesday, 6 p.m. air check. Yeah. And they just record the 6 p.m. news on this air check tape again and again and again and again until finally somebody said, this tape is going to stop running in another right. two runs, so we'd be able to replace it. So then they pop that in a box somewhere, and now we have that, but that's a matter of circumstance. If it's a network, we don't have flipper shows and stuff like that because these are network shows, right? And they wouldn't have uh, the rights to them, so they wouldn't have them around. Uh, not only for their space issues, but probably the network at some point was like, "Give us this, you know, don't 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 keep that lying around." They were less worried about intellectual property and their rights to things. Right, fifty years ago than they are now because now it's a massive obsession of people who do things on YouTube. Now there's more lawyers who who specialize right. in things. <laughs> Does anybody they were, remember there was a guy uh, in Coconut Grove named Chuck Azar, who just decided at one point to record everything on pneumatic tape? Did, Kevin, does that ring a bell for you? No. Uh, Chuck Azar just decided everything needed to be saved, and and he just bought pneumatic tape by the cartons and recorded all sorts of stuff. Now, I think he, he especially recorded local news and stuff, but but uh, just decided that uh, it, it hit him like a uh, like a, a brick in the head one day that everything needed to be saved. And, and he spent more money than anybody I ever knew to, on videotape and uh, and had his archive. Uh, I wonder yeah. what, what would have happened to that. Now, obviously uh, no issues were considered there in terms of copyright. He just recorded everything. Right, and, uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I haven't I haven't heard his name come up in some years, but the, that stuff is out there somewhere. Unless you know he died and his kids burned it, or just thought this is ridiculous, or or well, like happened with so many people, they used the tape over again. Well, using a U-matic over again would have been a bit of a challenge, unless you know it's not exactly oh let's record our wedding on U-matics and have a team do it. Um, but we have not heard of that. We would love to hear about that. Although, if they've been thoughtfully storing it in a shed in the back of the backyard yeah. in Florida, we don't want to hear about that because it will be a festival <laughs> of cold and horribleness, and it will just yeah. make us sad. Imagine um, mold and magnetic tape. Yeah, some people who worked for stations uh, had beta cam machines of their own at yeah. home and recorded uh, stuff. And sometime we may, at some future point, uh, have. Uh, donations from them that are have more extensive uh, copies of material and might be better quality copies of some of the material because yeah. uh, they had uh, 
my image of this is that they had a guy or a girl, most likely a guy, who worked overnight and he would get the tapes of stories and they would say, put this on the archive reel, put this on the archive reel. And the archive tape was probably not the newest, best, brandest, brand new tape they had. Right. And so it would just be edited on, edited on. And if that machine in that suite was tracking funny or if he didn't adjust the audio very well, exactly uh, right. we live with that. Whereas people who are doing it at home for their private thing are probably more careful, but who knows? One day maybe we'll find out. That'll be fun. I still have original uh, uh, open reel half inch videotapes uh, from the 70s. And I don't, wow. I don't, I don't know uh, who in their right mind would keep a machine like that around to, uh, to play that kind of stuff. But even for example, as I mentioned before, the VHS C format, you know, um, somewhere, somewhere I have that, that converter, you know, that little adapter somewhere. But, um, but yeah, just having a VCR that plays decently. Uh, you know, there were very professional umatic machines out there that were pretty st steady, but the average one that you would buy at uh, at, at uh, Brandsmart was kind of a throwaway machine, really. Right. Well, a umatic. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop right there recording, and then we can just anybody wants to hang out, and ask some more questions. I'll just say thanks to everybody for being with us today, and uh, and you'll be able to find the recording online at uh, MPNOD. Yeah, boop, boop mpnod.org later on and uh, thanks to uh, to kevin and renee for all the hard work that they put into bringing us a wonderful presentation today we thank you so much guys that was really thank wonderful you. thank you <laughs> thank you so much for your hospitality and and as i said earlier uh, we'd love to have you at the archives and if you have an idea for something that you'd like to to see and for us to put together please let us know and we love like i said we play requests so yeah. um have a, have a great day. That's wonderful. Thanks, Kevin. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks.